Well, can I encourage you to have your Bibles open at John's third letter, the third epistle of John. And as we noted last Sunday evening, second and third John have been described as twin sisters, sharing both style and substance. But they are not identical twins, as we will see this evening. Second John, as we saw last week, was written under the pseudonym of the chosen or elect lady to get that letter through to a church. But third John is written to a named person. And again, there are similarities in the text with John's other New Testament writings. And by the second century, he was acknowledged as the author of this letter. So with both internal and external evidence, we have pretty safe ground to say it was the Apostle John who wrote under the guidance of the Holy Spirit with apostolic authority. And again, we see in verse 1, in typical first century style, the author of the letter signs the top of the letter. But once again, he doesn't use his name, does he? He signs as the elder. He was, of course, the last of the apostles by now. But by referring to himself as the elder, he's not just referring to himself as an elderly gentleman. Neither is he just referring to himself as an elder of the church in Ephesus, where presumably he is writing from, but he is an elder with apostolic authority over every congregation. And although he naturally shies away from using his name in his writings, this is a very personal letter. And this personal letter shows that the person receiving the letter will have known it was from him. He's writing to a close friend and fellow believer, a friend that he loves in and through Christian truth. John is writing to Gaius. Now, the name Gaius appears four times in the New Testament, but we're not told which Gaius this is referring to. It's been suggested that the name Gaius was a very common name in the first century Roman world, as common as Thomas or John is today. But we're going to look at this letter tonight, uh, and we'll use two simple headings, which I hope will be helpful to remember and to think upon for ourselves. So firstly tonight, a good example to follow. A good example to follow. Doesn't get much simpler than that, does it? So the Gaius that John is writing to is doing well spiritually. He's persevere, persevering and growing in the faith. And John desires that the same measure of spiritual health that Gaius knows would also be known physically as well. Look at verse 2. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So here's the Apostle John, and he's writing to another Christian. But he has both a physical and a spiritual concern for his fellow Christian. Now our world puts a great emphasis on getting fit and strong and healthy and active. But I wonder how concerned we are about developing spiritually, strengthening our faith, growing in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was the old American preacher, Billy Sunday, who said this, if nine tenths of you were as weak physically as you are spiritually, you couldn't walk. He makes a good point, doesn't he? Imagine your physical strength tonight was matched to your spiritual strength. How strong would you be? Or well, to turn it round another way, 
how weak might it expose us to be? Gaius here was spiritually healthy, even though he may have been struggling physically. And I wonder if we have that desire to see our brothers and sisters in Christ doing well physically and spiritually, enjoying both physical and spiritual wellness, because the Apostle John did. Listen to the encouragement that the Apostle Paul gave to the Corinthians. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And so whatever is happening to us physically and practically, the true Christian trusting in Christ alone can say as we sang at the beginning of our service, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Can you say that tonight? Trusting only in Christ, can you say it is well with my soul? Well, it was well with Gaius and his soul. Look at verse 3. When some Christian brothers came to John, they brought a report back to him about Gaius. And it was a good report. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. So Gaius had a consistent testimony. He knew and he believed the truth and he was living in the light of that truth. And as we saw last time from 2 John, to know and believe biblical truth is one thing, to live out that truth is another thing. That's walking in truth, which is what God commands us to do. Now, it could be that John had been instrumental in the conversion of Gaius. In other words, he was the one who helped Gaius uh, understand the gospel and was there when he trusted the saviour of sinners, which is why John says in verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in truth. Gaius was born again. And perhaps John was instrumental in him coming to Christ. But Gaius had started out on the Christian pathway and John rejoices to know that he continues to walk with the Lord. And a consistent walk with the Lord is a good testimony that comforts and encourages fellow Christians rather than being a concern to them. But why was Gaius spiritually healthy? Why was he doing well spiritually? Well, it was because he was a committed Christian, committed to the truth of the gospel, committed to living out that truth, living in obedience to the Lord. Well, how else is Gaius a good example to us? Look at verse 5. We learn there that Gaius was faithful in providing hospitality. In his own home, at his own expense, Gaius was often entertaining Christians. Now, in the first century, when Christian missionaries or itinerant preachers traveled, they relied on hospitality, the hospitality of local Christians. They couldn't check into the nearest travel lodge or premier inn, not just because of the expense of that, because those inns of that era were nothing more than brothels. So instead, local believers would put these Christians up, even though they were strangers, and then they would help them on to their next destination. And that's exactly what John is commending Gaius for doing. Verse 5, you are faithful in what you are doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. Verse 6, they have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. 
So this isn't just showing hospitality to those within his own church. This is showing hospitality to the Lord's servants as they are engaged in gospel work. And why should we offer such hospitality to Christian workers? Look at verse 7. It was for the sake of the name that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. Because these missionaries, these preachers, were going in the name of Jesus Christ. They were not looking to the world to finance them or to resource them. They were looking to the Lord in faith to provide for them. And the means which the Lord used to provide for them was the generosity of believers. Verse 8. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. So in contrast to those false teachers which John warned us about in 2 John, that we shouldn't help them or encourage them, these true teachers of 3 John, even though they were unknown to Gaius, were to be helped in their gospel work. Gaius saw in them a genuine Christianity. He recognized they knew the truth and they walked in the truth and so was happy to support them. And even though he didn't become a missionary with them, even though he didn't pack his bags and go with them on his travels, by supporting them, by encouraging them, he became a co-worker for the truth. And that's an encouragement for us in supporting gospel work. We may not travel, we may not go to some of these places that Christian workers go to. We may not engage in the things that they are doing. But behind the scenes, we can be co-workers for the truth. Some Christians can be proactive in their prayerful support for missionaries and gospel work. But this isn't just about a prayerful support. This is about a practical support. And Gaius is commended here for playing a part in their gospel work by simply supporting them behind the scenes, out of sight, in the silent, but supporting them nonetheless. And so in that way, Gaius is a good example to you and I. So I wonder, are we dedicated to hospitality like that? Are we faithful in our support, encouraging the Lord's work and the Lord's workers. So can you see how Gaius, this man from the first century, is a good example for us to follow. He was spiritually strong through knowing and believing Christian truth and walking in the light of that truth. He's a good example to us because he maintained whose example and Christian walk was noted by all and therefore is well spoken of by everyone. He had a good report, and even by the truth itself. And John adds, we also speak well of him. I wonder what the report is about us. I don't mean when we're here together on a Sunday or on a Tuesday or at other times when the church meets. I wonder what the report is about us at other times do we have that consistent testimony so how is your spiritual strength tonight how is your testimony how is your support for gospel work well in this third letter of john we have a good example to follow the philippians were told by the apostle paul whatever happens Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Of course, the greatest example for us to follow is greater than Gaius or Demetrius or even the apostle John. Jesus Christ is our perfect example. 
And so let us desire to be more Christ-like. Well, moving on, secondly, from this letter, we see an example not to follow. A bad example not to follow. So if Gaius was held up by the Apostle John as a good example, he now shows us a bad example. Verse 9. Diotrephes. He's the example given. He's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. All we know about him comes from two verses. Verses 9 and 10. And if you look at verses 9 and 10, there's nothing positive in those verses. Verse 9, John tells Gaius, who could be a deacon in the church, in this very personal letter, John tells him that he's written to the church. But the letter never reached the congregation. Look at what he says. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will have nothing to do with us. This man, Diotrephes, is bad news for the church. Here is someone who loves the limelight. He likes to ensure that he has the preeminence in all things. But as the Apostle Paul made it clear to the uh, Colossians, because Christ is who he is, he deserves the preeminence that in everything he might have the supremacy. Diotrephes liked the supremacy himself. And not only did he like to be top dog, he wasn't going to accept authority from anyone else, not even the apostles, not even the visiting preachers bringing God's word. And he's not just content to dismiss their preaching, to dismiss their letters, to dismiss their apostolic authority. Look what he's doing in verse 10. John says he's so controlling, so conceited, he also stops those who want to do so. He actively prevents people like Gaius entertaining Christians. And what happens when they dare to go against what he wants? When he, they welcome preachers and missionaries? But notice there is no mention of Diotrephes knowing the truth, let alone walking in the truth. And here is a self-centered man having his own way in the church. Now, there used to be a strapline on adverts for a new release of a film, a movie, and it used to say, coming to a cinema near you, with a much deeper voice, coming to a cinema near you. Well, we should be on our guard because a Diotrephes could be coming to a church near you even here. Pride fueled Diotrephes' attitude and behavior, and pride continues to be at the root of many problems in churches today. That's why, as we saw uh, when we looked through John's first epistle, we must test the spirits. That's why we should scrutinize the essence of these so-called deceivers and their message as we saw in John's first letter and his second letter. And that's why we need to ensure that we are spiritually strong, as we saw at the beginning of this letter. Now, although Diotrephes quite well have been, uh, may have been a uh, false Christian, true Christians must ensure that we do not emulate some of his characteristics. How easy it is for us even as true believers, to display some of his characteristics that he's authority. How easy it is for us to be like him in talking down fellow Christians, giving them the cold shoulder. Can you see how Diotrephes is an example not to follow? He loved himself and his prominence. He slandered believers. He gave the cold shoulder 
to fellow believers who were missionaries, visiting preachers. He excommunicated loyal believers. What pride. What arrogance. What sinfulness. Now we've used that word a lot tonight, haven't we? Example. Look up the word example in the dictionary and you'll read this. A pattern or model, something to be imitated or avoided. And what John states quite clearly for Gaius in the first century is still vital to you and I today in the 21st century. Look at verse 11. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. We're to follow a godly, Christ-like example. We are not to follow a godless, self-centered example. And the way that we live and behave in the church, in the home, in the workplace, in university, in our community, will ultimately demonstrate who we belong to. Look what John says. Anyone who does good is from God. This isn't the occasional good work. This is an habitual living. Anyone who does good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. What's he saying? Consistent godly living will prove that that person is walking in truth. Whereas consistent ungodly living will prove that they are not walking in truth and cannot do so because they are strangers to God. Look at verse 12. Gaius can trust John's appraisal of the situation because he has a proven and truthful track record as one who consistently and persistently walks in the truth. That's why John can say with a clear conscience, you know that our testimony is true. And in similar fashion to concluding his second letter, John expresses in verse 13, he could have filled much more than a single piece of paper when he was writing to him. Instead, he hopes to speak face to face. In other words, John hopes to enjoy real, meaningful fellowship with him soon. Even that hospitality that Gaius is famous for. But what a blessing it is when believers get to spend meaningful time together, face to face, mutually encouraging, edifying fellowship together. But you see, under Diotrephes, verse 14, the church wasn't a very friendly place. It certainly didn't enjoy peace, which is perhaps why John closes his letter with those four words, peace be to you, because they needed peace. And trusting the Lord Jesus alone for salvation made them brothers and sisters in Christ. But in this letter, notice, John doesn't call them brothers and sisters there. He refers to Christians as friends. Isn't this a warm letter? Friends. And he wants Gaius to greet all of the friends warmly and personally. And isn't that a reminder? That the place that we call a church, when the church gathers, should be characterized by peace and friendliness. The local church should be intimate enough to know people personally so that they're not lost in a crowd, but loved for and cared for as friends. Jesus referred to his followers as friends, didn't he? And he laid down his life for his friends. And the church of Jesus Christ should display such friendly, brotherly love. And not the divisions which sadly have become all too familiar. So from John's third letter, we've seen two simple things. A good example to follow. A bad example not to follow. The question for you, the question for me, is when we leave through those doors tonight, which example will we follow? 
Are you a Gaius? Are you a Diotrephes? Whose characteristics are going to be evident in us tonight and throughout this coming week? Well, let us, by the grace of God, seek to follow the good example of Gaius, spiritually strong and mature as a Christian, with a consistent testimony, faithful in hospitality and a sacrificial love for the Lord's work and the Lord's workers, all for God's glory.